The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Advances in Medical Options for Uterine Fibroids and Endometriosis, Clinical Highlights from Montreal. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash NNZ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Hi, I'm Dr. Elizabeth Stewart from Mayo Clinic. Welcome to this educational activity focusing on emerging data on medical options for the treatment of endometriosis and uterine fibroids. Uh, this data was presented at the 5th Congress of the Society for Endometriosis and Uterine Disorders that was held in Montreal in May 2019. The emerging medical therapy depends currently on the shared hormonal dependence of endometriosis, uterine fibroids, and adenomyosis. Steroid hormones are important modulators of all three of these diseases, and thus most current therapy is focused on this modulation. We'll start by examining the data being presented on uterine fibroids. Uterine fibroids are a significant uh, burden for women in the healthcare system. Fibroids cause heavy menstrual bleeding, um, discomfort, pain, infertility, and while many are asymptomatic, um, there are severe symptoms. The burden of disease is most profound for black women who have earlier disease and more severe disease, and fibroids are the most common cause of hysterectomy in the U.S. There are also uh, consequences to fibroids in terms of post-surgical complications and recurrence. Fibroids cause increased work absenteeism, and the direct costs have been estimated to be somewhere between four and $10 billion annually in the U.S. alone. Medical management for uterine fibroids in the U.S. Uh, depends on the symptom. For women with heavy menstrual bleeding, the primary hormonal treatment option is um, oral contraceptives or other um, uh, contraceptive steroids. Uh, this data was not presented at the meeting, but comes from a review we published uh, several years ago. However, for women with uterine fibroids with bulk symptoms, with or without heavy menstrual bleeding, the primary medical therapy is GnRH agonists, and they're usually a temporizing solution to either get women to a future pregnancy or to tide women over to menopause. However, outside the U.S., where progesterone receptor modulators or PERMs are, the, are available, these have become the first-line therapy for all women, except women with hysteroscopically resectable submucous fibroids. Uterine fibroids have a classification system that we should discuss briefly, and there's a new information on genetics and epigenetics. Increasingly, we describe fibroids based on the FIGO classification, where submucous fibroids are indicated as 0, 1, or 2, depending on their intercavitary extent. The rest of the fibroids um, are categorized based on their relationship to the intramural portion of the uterus and the serosal surface, and there are also hybrid designations available. There's also new published information about the genetics of uterine fibroids, and in all population, about 70% of fibroids result from a mutation in the MED12 gene. Uh, this doesn't yet have clinical relevance, but based on some of the information at the recent meeting, it appears not only genetics, but epigenetics, or turning on or off the genes and not changing the DNA may be playing a role in uterine fibroids. And these epigenetic changes may be coming from a variety of environmental stimuli, including nutrition, stress, and endocrine disrupting chemicals. So this is an important facet of fibroid biology that's important to follow. GnRH analogs uh, work centrally by downregulating the 
hypothalamic pituitary axis. What's new is that there's a new generation of orally administered medications rather than long-acting injections. And these newer drugs can also allow better modulation of estrogen levels that limit uh, hypoestrogenic side effects. Uh, there was data reported on the GNRH antagonist oligolics that was presented at this meeting. There were two studies uh, that were replicate studies and both examined oligolics alone compared to placebo and oligolics plus uh, estradiol and norethindrone acetate ad back treatment. The data presented at the meeting showed that both elagolics and elagolics with ADBAC significantly decreased heavy menstrual bleeding. It decreased symptom severity of uterine fibroids and both increased the health-related quality of life compared to placebo. Most importantly, however, the elagolics with ADBAC appeared to mitigate the bone loss that occurred with the elagolics alone suggesting that elagolics with ADBAC may give optimal efficacy with minimization of the important medical side effects. At the meeting, there was also data presented on the elagolics extension study that we just discussed. Women were re-randomized to either elagolics twice daily with or without ADBAC. Again, the primary endpoint was uh, defined as um, decreased heavy menstrual bleeding, and at 12 months um, that there was approximately a 90% response rate. The most frequent adverse events that were seen occurring more than 5% of the time were hot flushes, night sweats, nausea, headache, and nasopharyngitis. And again, not surprisingly, the bone mineral density loss was lower with ADBAC therapy than with elagolics alone. The second GNRH antagonist we'll look at is relagolics, and these uh, start with phase two studies that were presented at the meeting. They tested three different doses, 10 milligrams, 20 milligrams, and 40 milligrams, and did a 12-week study uh, with follow-up uh, four weeks later. With these studies, they found a dose-dependent decrease in a measure of heavy menstrual bleeding and found, again, a dose-related effect of, on amenorrhea, as well as a reduction in fibroid volume and uterine volume, with the highest dose appearing to be the most effective. The once-daily um, relagolics was also compared in a non-inferiority study to monthly uh, GNRH injections with luparelin, and uh, they were found to be equivalent and non-inferior. There was also reports on the phase three Liberty trials of relagolics, where uh, a combination therapy was used for 12 weeks uh, 24 weeks was used as the primary endpoint, and at 52 weeks, uh, subjects had the option of entering the extension study. With all of the responses, there was a highly significant response rate um, with a reduction in menstrual blood loss, reduced pain, improved quality of life. They also saw in these studies um, amenorrhea achieved in a significant number of women and improvement in anemia in women with anemia at baseline. Finally, they saw reduced uterine volume, all important endpoints for fibroid therapies. A second class of drugs where there were multiple reports at SUD included the selective progesterone receptor modulators. In contrast to the GNRH agonists, um, SPRMs or PERMs um, have an effect at, directly at the fibroid at the level of the endometrium for control of menstrual bleeding, and then also centrally. Yolopristal acetate is approved for use outside the U.S., uh, both for preoperative treatment uh, for uh, one course of therapy for women with moderate to severe symptoms of uterine fibroids 
There is also an approval for intermittent therapy for women who are not eligible for surgery. There has been a change since the first approval in that liver monitoring is now required before starting treatment, um, during treatment, and uh, follow-up after treatment. Uh, there was also some extension proposed at the meeting by investigators that potentially um, longer-term use may be indicated, uh, but this currently is not approved either in the U.S. or outside the U.S. Eulopristal acetate was also studied in the Venus II study design. Um, where uh, this is a phase three prospective randomized double-blind uh, placebo-controlled trial uh, with a crossover as well. And four, 400 patients were studied in this trial. The primary endpoint of this trial is amenorrhea rate during at least uh, 35 consecutive days. And what they found was that uh, this was an effective treatment option both in the overall population and in different racial groups and also um, obese versus non-obese subjects. One of the concerns was that in the European studies that led to eulopristal approval, there were very few black women and very few obese women and the U.S. population. These are both important target populations. They also saw significant improvements from baseline to end of treatment in uterine fibroid quality of life scores, again, both in the overall population and in the two important subgroups. A current hot topic in the field is the concern regarding liver safety of eulopristal acetate and possibly other progesterone receptor modulators. The application for eulopristal acetate was not approved by the U.S. FDA, um, citing safety concerns following um, an examination of rare but serious liver injury cases outside the U.S. There was a um, investigation that found that there were four women that required liver transplantation and that liver injury appeared to occur approximately once in 100,000 women. After this uh, European medical investigation, regular liver function tests are recommended at baseline during the first two cycles and one month after. Um, and right now there's questioning whether this is a true side effect of the um, medication or whether this is um, an effect of the baseline rate of liver disease. So talking with women about um, liver safety is an important part of initiating this therapy. A second progesterone receptor modulator, Villaprasan, was also discussed uh, with the results of the Asteroid 2 study where Villaprasan was compared both with placebo and eulopristal acetate. What they found was significant rates of amenorrhea and reduction in heavy menstrual bleeding and also significant changes in the three largest fibroids. In the Villaprasan asteroid one and two phase two studies, when they were pooled for analysis, uh, the best 12-week outcomes were seen with a dose of two milligrams of Villaprasan. It rapidly controlled heavy menstrual bleeding and provided amenorrhea in more than 83% of the patients. Again, uh, a reduction in uterine fibroid volume was seen and there was significant symptomatic relief. Moreover, there were no unexpected safety findings in this study. There are other investigational agents that were reported at this meeting for uterine fibroids. Um, there's a group that's working on simvastatin, um, and uh, this is an interesting drug, not only because it's a statin and widely used for other indications, but it also shares the same um, effector pathway that eulopristol does. So potentially there could be synergistic effects from the use of these two drugs. 
Uh, there is some preclinical studies and some epidemiologic evidence that suggest simvastatin on its own is a promising treatment for uterine fibroids. And there's now an ongoing phase two clinical trial uh, that uh, is trying to look at the clinical efficacy specifically for uterine fibroids. So we've talked a little bit about oral G and RH antagonists for fibroids as well as progesterone receptor modulators. There's also some interest in using aromatase inhibitors that are widely used for breast cancer and repurposing them for fibroid treatment. So in summary, uh, what we've learned about the medical treatment of uterine fibroids from uh, the SUD 2019 meeting is that epigenetics may be important in the development of uterine fibroids. There's emerging evidence that GnRH antagonists um, may be effective treatment options for uterine fibroids. There's additional data that progesterone receptor modulators um, are effective treatments and that they do provide efficacy in a U.S. population with more diversity of both race and um, body mass index and that simvastatin may be um, a treatment option for uterine fibroids in the future. We're going to switch gears now and talk about endometriosis and endometriosis-associated pain, another important gynecologic disease. And again, the burden of endometriosis in the United States is substantial. Um, it's a significant cause of pain and infertility with more than four million reproductive age women having endometriosis. And amazingly, it, it seems as though about 60% of cases are undiagnosed. So these numbers may be substantially higher. The disease causes uh, increases in work absenteeism. It's associated with substantial healthcare costs and following uterine fibroids is the second most common reason for hysterectomy. There are a wide variety of agents that are used for the medical management of endometriosis and endometriosis-associated pain. The first line uh, is typically non-steroidal agents or combined um, uh, oral contraceptives. If this is not effective, then moving on to a second line agent, um, which typically is either a another variety of contraceptive formulations such as continuous combined oral contraceptives, medroxyprogesterone acetate, or the levonorgestrel intrauterine system. Additionally, GnRH agonists or antagonists, either alone or in combination with ADVAC therapy, is considered second-line therapy, as is the oral agent Danazol. Finally, aromatase inhibitors are third-line therapy. It's also worth keeping in mind that medical treatment is typically the preferred treatment uh, in women of reproductive age in pain and no desire for pregnancy if surgery is contraindicated or refused. And there's also a role for medical therapy to prevent or to treat recurrence. Endometriosis is highly variable, both in terms of its symptoms and its treatment options. With the bar graph, you see that painful periods um, are the most common symptom, but there is a variety of uh, other symptoms, including uh, gastrointestinal symptoms that are actually present in a si significant subpopulation of women with fibroids. And then when you look at the treatment options employed as first line, uh, treatments. Uh, in the circular graph, you find that oral contraceptives are the preferred first line in many um, populations, but there is a wide variety of approaches uh, that are used worldwide. With medical management of endometriosis, the primary target for most drugs is modulation of the steroid hormones. Uh, but uh, with endometriosis targeting the endometrium it is also a different um, strategy that has um, some evidence for efficacy. 
one of the characteristics of endometriosis is not only is this disease um, more sensitive to estrogen and can be related to local estrogen production, there's also a progesterone resistance that is seen and increased inflammation, which plays more of a role in this disease than in uterine fibroids. Again, there are currently available hormonal treatments for endometriosis. In the U.S., there are three GnRH analogs. Elagolix has now been approved as an oral GnRH antagonist for endometriosis. And uh, there are a number of progestins that are, are available for uh, endometriosis treatment. Uh, there are slightly different drugs that are available in the European market, both in the GnRH analogs category and the progestin category. So with endometriosis, GnRH analogs work in a similar fashion as they do in uh, uterine fibroids, that uh, the action is central and leads to not only decreased pituitary hormones, but decreased estradiol, and this can lead to su substantial hypoestrogenic symptoms. So there was also a reported study on tiparelin, another GnRH antagonist, following conservative surgery for deep infiltrating endometriosis. This was a non-interventional study that uh, followed women for 24 months after 24 weeks of treatment in almost 400 women. The primary objective of the study was to look at endometriosis-related pain from the pre-surgical baseline and secondarily to look at symptom recurrence. What they found was that pelvic pain, ovulation pain, and dyspareunia were reduced by month three and maintained through the 24 months. The dysmenorrhea increased slightly from 9.5% at 12 months to 15% um, at 24 months, um, and hot flashes and um, night sweats were the most commonly reported adverse effects. With endometriosis, there was also data presented regarding the use of oral GnRH antagonists. And again, uh, GnRH antagonists um, have the advantage of better modulation so that the profound hypoestrogenic symptoms you see with parenteral GnRH antagonists um, are avoided. Data on uh, the phase three trials of Elagolix uh, were presented uh, at this meeting as well. Uh, this data has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine and uh, uh, showed efficacy uh, with six months of uh, treatment in women with moderate to severe endometriosis-associated pain. With pain and fatigue outcomes, it uh, appears that, uh, uh, that both higher and lower doses of allegolix were effective in improving dysmenorrhea and non-menstrual pelvic pain, and there was also improvement in fatigue. Bone mineral density um, is also an important outcome. And again, the combination of a low-dose add-back therapy appears to mitigate some of the morbidity of bone loss in ongoing clinical trials. Data on linzagolix, another oral GnRH antagonist, was presented, including the Edelweiss Phase II study uh, in this study, over 300 women were randomized to five different doses of linzagolix or placebo, and this study showed that there were dose-dependent uh, reductions in serum estradiol levels and endometriosis-associated pain after 12 weeks of treatment. The effects were maintained or increased at 24 weeks, and there were no unexpected safety issues. There's also ongoing trials of this agent in phase three called Primrose 1 and 2, and the doses chosen for this study are linzagolic 75 milligrams and a 200 milligram dose with estrogen and progestin add back. The third um, 
GnRH antagonist for endometriosis that had data presented was Rulagolix. Uh, again, this was a phase two study and a phase two extension study uh, that uh, used injectable luparelin and found that pain reduction was similar uh, with this oral agent. Again, there are ongoing um, uh, phase three studies, this one termed spirit and spirit extension, uh, where uh, the long-term efficacy is being examined for up to 104 weeks with ad back therapy. So uh, nice long-term data uh, that should be coming out. There was also data presented on progestins for the treatment of endometriosis. And again, progestins can help by um, affecting not only steroid hormone action, but through the inflammation pathway. So again, uh, there are some progestins that are labeled for the treatment of endometriosis, including Danazol and Dinogest, and there are additional ones that are used um, off-label. Dynogest um, has some data that shows it improves the quality of life in a Japanese study um, and that it provides long-term pain relief in a study uh, conducted in Europe. There's also some evidence that uh, long-term treatment uh, reduced pain and avoided pain recurrence post-surgery for up to 60 months. So we're beginning to accumulate some real-world long-term data on this progestin uh, that uh, there was substantial um, improvement in quality of life and that cumulative uh, incidence of symptom recurrence was approximately 80% with, without post-operative medication, but this was reduced to less than 10% uh, with progestin therapy. Uh, and again, there was a study sh that showed uh, with deep infiltrating endometriosis, uh, Dynogest may play a role. There's also reported data on other investigational agents for endometriosis, aromatase inhibitors, and especially the combination of anastrozole with levonorgestrel um, IUS system may provide a combination therapy that uh, gives synergistic benefit. Uh, again, there's a phase 2B study uh, that's taking place using the delivery of anastrozole and levonorgestrel as a part of an intravaginal ring compared to both placebo and luprolide acetate. Like with fibroids, there's evidence that epigenetics may be playing a role in the uh, pathogenesis of endometriosis, uh, and this may um, play another role in the efficacy of progesterone receptor modulators. S um, there are some new targets that are being defined as um, epigenetic regulation, including some DNA methyltransferases and other molecular signatures that may respond to progesterone modulation. Villaprasan is a progesterone receptor modulator that um, has a high selectivity for the progesterone receptor and um, has some tolerability advantages compared to other uh, progesterone re receptor modulators tested for endometriosis. There's a study called Villendo uh, that's using Villaprasan in a phase 2B trial for women with symptomatic endometriosis. There was also some data presented at the meeting on uh, new investigational treatments for endometriosis-associated pain that don't modulate steroid hormones, and I think this is a really exciting development for the future. Uh, drugs that target invasion or chronic inflammation or neuroangiogenesis and fibrosis may one day be used as treatment for endometriosis without affecting the steroid hormone system. That ends our discussion today. I hope you found the activity informative and useful to your practice. Thank you very much for participating.
Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash NNZ 860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AbV. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.